digital marketing. Sorry, Randy. <laughs> <laughs> That's okay. Um, I'm Randy Chan. I'm the director of channel marketing at HTP Books. And I work with my colleague, Pamela Oste, who's here tonight, to market to three different channels, um, to librarians, to independent bookstores, and to Barnes & Noble in the US. Um, I'm based in, in Toronto, um, and I've been here at Harlequin Trade Publishing since 2016. And before that, I was at Penguin Random House Canada, where I was uh, Director of Strategic and Consumer Partnerships. And I've also worked at House of Anansi Press, which is a Canadian publisher, and at HarperCollins Canada. So I've been working in publishing for 25 years now. And some of you who have been to Bookstravaganza before know the drill. Um, my colleagues and I will give you a sneak peek tonight at our best books being released this spring and summer. We have the editors behind some of these books, as well as uh, the marketing team who are working on the campaigns. My colleagues are joining from both our New York and our Toronto locations. So at Harlequin, a lot of our editors um, and our publicists and people on our foreign rights team, they work out of the New York office, while in Toronto, we have the marketing team and our art designers. So we're constantly on virtual meetings with one another, and we've been doing that for many years. So tonight we're presenting enchanting debut novels, new books by authors you already love, and we're resurrecting a popular part of book extravaganza, which is the presentation of a book cover design, and this time for a novel called The Housekeepers. So it's nice to see many of you join tonight. Thank you for coming. We hope you love these new books as much as we do. So I'm going to start us off tonight with the first presentation. Uh, and the book is called The London Seance Society by Sarah Penner. And um, I can't talk about the new book without referencing the first book, which was The Lost Apothecary. And that was a worldwide bestseller. I, I wanna say phenomenon. Uh, it was a book we debuted here with the gloss years ago. And I remember our art director, Kathleen, walking you through all the different drafts of the book cover. And then The Lost Apothecary came out into the world and it was a massive success. It was the Barnes & Noble Discover Pick. It was named Best Book of the Year by Barnes & Noble. It was the number one library reads pick as voted by librarians all over the US. An Indie Next pick, an Amazon Book of the Month pick, you name it, it got it. And what readers repeatedly said that they loved about The Lost Apothecary was that it felt fresh and it was gothic in tone and it had feminist themes to it. It featured a mysterious apothecary owner who would dispense poison to women and only women. And the poison was to kill the men in their lives who had wronged them. And if you've read it, you know how special this book is. Really, the new book, The London Sands Society, has all of that and more. The London Sands Society is set in the 1800s, Paris and London. It follows a mysterious woman named Vaudeline Delaire, who is a French medium, and her special skill is to solve homicides through seances. That is, she conjures up the spirit of the murder victims in order to solve the crime. And then Vaudeline is summoned to London to help the London Seance Society with a high profile murder. But things aren't right from the get go. And soon Vaudeline becomes entangled in a dangerous web of crime and murder herself. This is Gothic, it's spellbinding, it's feminist, all the things that people loved about the lost apothecary. As part of her research into this book, the author attended seance sessions and um, she's written about it in um, articles. It's fascinating. The early reads on this has been amazing. The book comes out next month. And I have honestly, truly have yet to come across a single person, bookseller, librarian, reader who doesn't love this. In fact, many people are saying it's even better than The Lost Apothecary. In fact, it's just been made an Indie Next pick again by the American Booksellers Association. And that's very rare that an author's first two books would make that list twice. Personally, what I love about Sarah Penner is that 
it's like she comes up with these amazing concepts. It's almost like she works at a book laboratory and she turns out these perfect premises that check off a lot of boxes, but then she executes everything so well. So it's not just the concept, it's the journey of the novel, the tension, the creepiness. Like you feel like you're in Paris, you feel like you're in London in the 1800s, you smell the streets, you root for Vaudeline as she gets herself into a lot of trouble. And then when you're finished, it feels like you've read something that is truly one of a kind. So uh, Pam and I were about to travel to Seattle on Sunday for a week long event. It's called Winter Institute. It's the largest annual gathering of independent bookstores in the US. And Sarah Penner, the author, is one of five authors we're bringing to this event. Uh, there's going to be a massive book signing there with 1,500 booksellers. And we're hosting a big dinner one evening with 40 booksellers. Sarah Penner is going to speak there. She's going to wow everyone. And we're so excited. So needless to say, this is one of the biggest books of the year for us. And you'll be seeing a lot more of the London Science Society out into the world. Uh, so thank you. And now I'm going to turn it over to my colleague, Laura Brown. It's over to you. Thanks, Randy. Hi, the Gloss Book Clubbers. Um, I'm so excited to be with you tonight. I'm Laura Brown. I'm a senior editor over at Park Row. Um, it's so exciting to hear about all the Sarah Penner talk. We're just so happy um, to be publishing her again. Um, and I'm excited to share about two other books we're publishing at Park Row, um, that both that are near and dear to my editor heart. Um, the first one is Real Friends Talk About Race. So friendships can be messy. <laughs> There's no clear cut rules about how to be a friend and our culture doesn't really prioritize friendship the way it does romantic relationships. Making friends can be challenging, especially as an adult. And then if you add on top of that, when you have a friend you know, coming from a different racial background, things can get confusing fast. Real Friends Talk About Race is a guide to help you have stronger friendships across racial lines. The idea is that the more we can have open and honest conversations about race and racism and learn how to create safe spaces to have these conversations, the better friendships we'll have. These conversations can be uncomfortable and tricky to bring up, which is why Real Friends Talk About Race is such a great resource. The book is co-written by the podcast hosts of The Ken's Women, Yizu Makantabana and Hannah Summerhill. In the book, Hannah and Yizu use their own friendship and experiences from different racial backgrounds to offer guidance on how to have these layered conversations. They share real life examples of how they addressed race and racism at their places of work, in their friend groups, with romantic partners, in online interactions, and even within their own friendship. They cover important topics such as the white lens and the burden it places on friends of color, digital blackface and why cultural appropriation is harmful, and unpacking what it means to be an ally. There's so much useful information in this book. Honestly, it's the kind of guide that I've long wanted in my own library, and I'm really proud to be publishing it. Um, their podcast, The Ken's Women, um, I highly recommend you check it out. It's another really great resource. It's been featured on several women's outlets um, like Elle, Cosmo, Goop, Marie Claire, The Cut. Um, and if you give it a listen, you'll hear how Hannah and Yizu approach all of these topics with candor and just real love for each other. Um, I personally think it's amazing how transparent they are about the conflicts that come up in their own friendship. Um, you know, those are totally normal in any healthy relationship, um, but I really appreciate their transparency around that. Um, this book goes on sale in April, and I see it as a wonderful tool for people who want to engage in anti-racism work and really examine your own individual impact. My hope that is that this book will help readers feel more empowered in creating, creating equity in their own world, one friendship at a time. And turning just, it over to April Osborne. I don't know, Randy, do you do that or do sorry. I? You know what I was doing? I was looking up, uh, someone wanted to know the spelling of, of the Kinswoman um, podcast. So I was just double checking 
the, the spelling there. Um, but uh, let me just, uh, <laughs> anyways, uh, over to April Osborne, our senior editor at Mira, to talk about the next book. Thank you, Laura. Thanks so much, Randy. Um, I am a senior editor at Mira, um, and I'm so excited to tell you all about Cassandra in Reverse by Holly Smale. Um, this is Mira's, I'm sorry, I worked for Mira, which is uh, one of the imprints of Harlequin Drake Publishing. And this is Mira's big book club fiction title for summer 2023. Uh, it's for readers who love the Rosie Project and also the Midnight Library. Um, it's this delightful and uplifting story at about a woman named Cassandra who finds herself stuck in a time loop on the third worst day of her life. She's dumped in the morning and then fired by noon and the next day the whole thing just starts all over again. Uh, but rather than being defeated by this development, Cassandra learns to use her newfound power to travel back in time and fix all the moments when she's gone wrong, whenever she does or says or feels the wrong thing. And for Cassandra, things go wrong a lot. Uh, but as she tries desperately to save her relationship and her job, one small rewind at a time, uh, the past that she's been running from threatens to catch up to her, and she'll find that she's been trying to fix the wrong things all along. Uh, this is a story of family, of grief, and the power of sisterhood to overcome it all. It's told from the perspective of a woman who finds it impossible to think or process things the same way as everyone around her. It's also the story of a woman realizing that thinking and feeling differently doesn't make her broken. Um, Holly Smale is a best-selling young adult author in the UK, where she writes the Geek Girl series, which is currently being adapted as a Netflix series, uh, which you'll probably see sometime soon. Um, this is her adult debut. Um, she began writing it years ago with this idea for this character, but just not quite knowing what to do with her. And then in 2021, at the age of 39, Holly was diagnosed with autism, and a lot of things about herself and about Cassandra started to make sense. Um, I'm just going to read you a quick note from Holly, um, who says, I think we've all wondered where, um, sorry, I think we've all wondered where would we end up or who would we be if we could just go back in time and do things differently. And while the extraordinary among us might use time travel to change the world, I suspect a lot of us would end up using our new powers to rewind TV shows because we can't find the remote control or undo burnt toast or get back a partner who dumped us for no apparent reason. As a late diagnosed autistic woman, I've spent a lot of my life wishing I could undo things I have said or done, looping my memories to find a way to be more normal and less weird. And I've also spent a lot of time looking in books for people like me. But if art is a mirror held up to nature, then I have often felt like a ghost, seeking my own reflection, ripping down desk sheets and finding nothing. So with Cassie, I decided to make my own. Um, because whether we're saving the world uh, or using time travel to reheat tea, I suspect that deep down, we're not all that different. Um, when I read this manuscript on submission, I absolutely fell in love with Cassandra and it has been such a joy watching my colleagues do the same. Um, I just hope you all get a chance to read it and that you love her every bit as much as I do. Thank you, April. <clears throat> I, I don't know if you saw the chat box, but people are loving the comparisons to, you know, Midnight Library and Rosie Project. Um, I, I often think of this book as like Groundhog Day meets Bridget Jones in a way, if that's not too dated, um, but it's terrific. We love it. Um, and then now back to Laura Brown from Parker Row Books. Yeah, thanks, Randy. Um, yeah, so The Enchanted Hacienda is another heart project of mine. It's written by the incredible J.C. Cervantes, who's a New York Times bestselling author of YA and middle grade books. Um, this is her first adult novel, and wow, she's just knocked it out of the park. Um, the story is a little bit like Encanto, but with adult characters and a heavy sprinkle of romance. Um, it tells the story of Harlow Estrada, a young Mexican-American woman who is part of a magical family. When she gets fired from her dream job and her boyfriend proves to be a jerk, she flees New York City and heads to the one place she can always call home, the Enchanted Hacienda, her family's magical flower farm in Mexico. 
The Estradas were gifted the power of magic by the Aztec goddess Mayuel and can make enchantments from the flowers they grow on their land. The only requirement is that someone from their family has to be present at the farm at all times. Each woman in the Estrada family has her own flower that she's named after and a special magical gift, such as the ability to create a love bond, erase memories, interpret dreams, or even glimpse the future. All except for Harlow, whose name translates to heap of stones. <laughs> How unfair is that? She doesn't seem to have inherited the magic gene like her sisters or her cousins, and it isn't until she spends time on the family farm and allows herself to follow her deepest passions that she unlocks her magical gift. But like all magic, it comes with a price. I fell head over heels for this story when this manuscript first landed on my desk. The way the Estrada women conjure their flower magic together reminds me of scenes from Practical Magic. There's a delightful cast of characters that make up the Familia Estrada, whose lives are woven together in Mexican folklore. My favorite thing, though, is how empowering the story is. It's a celebration of our unique gifts and finding the bravery to use them. Um, a little behind the scenes on the publishing side, I know we like to give glimpses of that. Um, this book went to a really big auction with 12 other editors um, trying to buy the Enchanted Hacienda. You could practically hear the cheers and house when we won that auction. Um, JC is just an incredible storyteller and I'm delighted to share we have a book two in the works as well. It takes place in the same universe as the Enchanted Hacienda, but it's told from Harlow's sister's perspective. Um, that's all I can say for now, but it's going to be just another amazing magic filled book. Um, JC was inspired to write this story um, by the Mexican folklore she heard growing up, um, especially from her mother's side of the family. Um, at, specifically about the goddess Mayuel, the story just really resonated with her um, and the story really sprung from that. Um, and I'm so glad she listened. This is such a special book and I hope you'll give it a try. Um, happy reading. Thanks, Laura. Um, I remember we met with JC Cervantes last month and I think she's amazing and I can't wait to meet her in person. She's coming to Winter Institute too. She's gonna knock, it, knock him out of the park. <clears throat> okay, so I'm presenting the next book, um, a novel called Paper Names by Susie Lau. And I'm gonna start by saying we're not supposed to pick favorites in publishing because truly we're passionate about all the books we present. But I do have a soft spot for this one. It was a very emotional read for me. And it's about a family who migrates to New York from China, trying to make ends meet. So we have the father, Tony, who was an engineer in China, but is now a doorman at a Manhattan apartment building. The mother, um, Kim, a doctor in China, now works at a bakery in New York. And then one day, while Tony is working as the doorman, he witnesses a violent altercation on the street in front of him. So he intervenes and he saves someone's life. And all of a sudden, Tony is a hero. The residents in the building host a party to celebrate him and everything is, is coming up roses. But it turns out this one act of intervention of saving a life reverberates and for the rest of the novel through decades, we see how that one day and that one action affects this entire family's life. So we follow a lawyer who witnessed the altercation on the street and how his life becomes intertwined with this family. And then we follow Tony and Kim's daughter as she grows up with people associated from that one day. This novel has so many layers. It's about race, it's about bad luck, it's about good luck, and it's about what we pass down from generations, about how one day could alter your life forever. And I remember this one scene um, where the family is being celebrated as heroes at this party, and Kim, the wife, brings homemade Chinese dumplings to this party for the guests to eat. But even as they're being celebrated, the dumplings get thrown into the garbage because they're not good enough compared to the catered fancy food 
at this party. So that was a really gut punch of a scene. And even though this novel says so much and covers a lot, it's actually a very spare and very short novel. I think it's just over 200 pages. Um, the author, Susie Lau, is an investment banker at Goldman Sachs. And honestly, she just decided one day she wanted to try writing a novel. And then bingo, out came Paper Names. And it's the novel that I keep thinking about months after I read it. Um, so my own family immigrated to Toronto in the 1970s from Hong Kong. And they were both teachers in Hong Kong, but their teaching certificates were not recognized here. So they had to start from scratch. And um, so my dad worked at Kentucky Fried Chicken um, night shifts. And my mom worked as a mailroom clerk and she would have to deliver mail to employees at Bell Canada, which is this big telecommunications company. But because she didn't really know English, she would look at the names on the envelopes and then match them up with the name plates outside each, each office and each cubicle, like almost like matching up hieroglyphs for her, right? Piecing together puzzles. And that's how she scraped by. So needless to say, books about families trying to make it against the odds or people pursuing the American dream really hits close to home for me. But really, I think this book is so interesting because it's also about how we can trace our circumstances and who we are back decades to the choices that someone else in our family made, whether that's a good thing or a bad thing. Um, I'm not the only one who loves this. Uh, Taylor Jenkins Reid, who wrote Daisy Jones and the Six, is a big fan. Um, so this novel, Paper Names, comes out in May. And I'm going to turn it and um, yeah, it's phenomenal. It's, it's the kind of book that once you finish reading it, you want to talk to somebody about it. Um, so I'm hoping to talk to you guys about it um, eventually. Uh, so I'm going to turn it back to April for the next book, which is by an author I know a lot of you love already. Thanks, Randy. Um, I am very excited to tell you about The Perfumist of Paris by Alka Joshi. Um, Alka is the New York Times bestselling art, uh, author of The Henna Artist, um, which was a Reese's Book Club pick and an instant bestseller. Um, and for readers who loved the series, this book is a perfect resolution to the epic saga of love, family, identity, and healing. But you don't have to have read the other books to enjoy this story of a woman fighting to find her place in the world. Um, this novel takes place in Paris in 1974, where Rada, the younger sister of the henna artist from the first book, is now 32, married with two young daughters and living in Paris, where she's pursuing a career in the highly competitive perfume industry. But scent isn't just Rada's livelihood, it's her passion. It stirs something deep inside of her, and her husband just can't understand why she spends so much time working away from their two children. Um, and with tensions in their marriage running high, Radha travels back to India to find an ingredient for her latest creation. But just as she does, the child that she gave up for adoption 17 years earlier, who her husband does not know about, arrives unannounced on her doorstep to accomplish her very controlled life. Um, this is a timeless story that feels so resonant 50 years after the time that it takes place. Um, it deals with issues that women are still dealing still struggling with today, um, and it transports readers from Paris to India in a way that feels completely immersive. And I promise that after reading this book, you will never think about fragrance the same way again. Um, so whether you're new to this series or coming back to this world one last time, I know you'll absolutely love this fabulous, powerful read. Um, this series is also being adapted as a Netflix series um, starring Frida Pinto. So if you haven't picked up the series yet, you still have time to dive in and finish the whole trilogy before the show arrives. Thank you, April. And um, sorry, we didn't put the on sale dates on here, but the Alka Joshi novel goes on sale March 28th, um, and uh, which is just next month. I know a lot of you will, will love this because I know you love Alka and we love Alka.
So um, now we're going to focus on one very special book. All of the books are special, as, as you, you all know by now. Um, where, but this, this time we're going to hear about the book from my colleague Melanie, and then we'll hear from the author through a video, and then we'll look at the book cover for this book. So here to tell you more about The Housekeepers is my colleague Melanie Freed. Yeah, hi everyone. I'm Melanie Freed. I'm a senior editor at Graydon House in New York, and I'm so excited to tell you today about debut novel, The Housekeepers. As Randy said, this is a special book coming out July 4th, and we are so thrilled to be publishing it. It's a dazzling historical novel for fans of The Lost Apothecary and The Christie Affair. Set in 1905, it's about a housekeeper who is unfairly dismissed from her position at a gorgeous stately home in London. So she decides to recruit an eclectic group of women to launch a revenge heist the night of the house's highly anticipated costume ball. We absolutely in-house fell in love with the concept of a feminist revenge heist orchestrated by women who have been underestimated and mistreated. We had to have it. And so we preempted it within a few days, which means we put together a compelling offer and convinced the agent to accept it without going back to editors at other publishers to see if they're interested. And we are so happy that we were successful in that. Um, the novel has a big hearted, gutsy underdog ensemble cast. It's impossible not to root for them. These women are not simply stealing a few items from this home. They're emptying every square inch of this enormous house during society's biggest high profile party this season. And you can't help but turn the pages to find out if and how they're going to pull it all off. Take it from Sarah Penner, author of The Lost Apothecary, who called the novel rollicking fun and entirely original and said anyone who relishes a good party gone wrong will devour this. Or Nina de Gramont, author of The Christie Affair, who raved that you'll never have so much fun cheering on grand larceny. Alex Hayes' writing is clever, cinematic, and sleek, and the elaborate over-the-top costume ball is a really fun backdrop as the crew launches their heist right under the noses of the heiress host, and all her society guests. But at its core, this is a novel about a group of working class women banding together, challenging systems of gender and class oppression and taking some of that power back for themselves, which means there's a lot to discuss here for book clubs. And in fact, we did an internal book club among our publishing team. And I'm told some of my colleagues in Toronto just couldn't wait to discuss the book and were already eagerly chatting about it over cubicle walls days before the meeting. So if feminist revenge plus a lavish party and daring heist sounds as irresistible to you as it did to us, make sure this one is on your to be read shelf for 2023. And next you'll hear from the very charming author himself. So back to you, Randy. Thanks, Melanie. Um, I think Aaron and Pam are queuing up the video. Um, you guys will love him. Hi everyone, this is Alex Hay, author of The Housekeepers, and I am so delighted that Graydon House is publishing my debut novel, and I just wanted to take a moment to tell you a little bit more about the story and how it came to be. So The Housekeepers is a historical heist novel set in July 1905, and it tells the story of Mrs King, charismatic housekeeper to one of Mayfair's grandest mansions. Now, Mrs. King has been serving this house loyally for 20 years, and so she is not a little annoyed when she is dismissed unfairly and turned out of the house. However, Mrs. King has a plan of her own, and by recruiting an eccentric gang of former servants and criminal associates, she's able to carry it out. And that plan is to strip this mansion of all of its beautiful treasures on the night of the grandest ball of the season, right under the nose of her former employer. As you can probably guess, writing The Housekeepers was an absolute delight. I'd always wanted to set a novel in the early 1900s because it's a fascinating period full of new money fighting with old and scrappy enterprising characters rising and driving for success. Plus, I've been dying to try and write my own heist novel because I've always loved that kind of juicy plot and I was longing to test the engineering and see if I could write one of my own. Interestingly, the house that this novel contains is inspired by some of the real mansions that were once scattered all across West London. These were huge, decadent, costly pleasure palaces almost, um, which were attended by a always obedient cast of servants. And the thought that had come into my mind in the summer of 2020, while I was washing the dishes, aptly enough, was what would happen if some of those obedient loyal servants downstairs decided they wanted to grab a little bit of that privilege upstairs 
for themselves. And thus, the idea for the housekeepers was born. And I was able to jump off on this joy joyful, joyous writing experience. And talking of joyous, it has been such a thrill, really the thrill of a lifetime, to see this book starting slowly to go out into the world. And so for that reason, I just wanted to say the most enormous thank you to all of you for all you are doing to bring it into the hands of North American readers. I love Mrs King and her gang and knowing they're going to get to put their best foot forwards with your care and your support is so important to me. And I'm so grateful. So genuinely, thank you all so very much for all you're doing and enjoy the rest of your meeting. I hope it goes well. All the best for now. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> isn't he lovely? <laughs> um, I should have mentioned from the top, Alex lives in London, well, as you now know, um, and this is very late for him, so that's why we asked him to contribute a video. Plus, he has a very busy week ahead. Um, early next week, he flies to New York to have sales meetings with uh, sales and marketing meetings in our New York office. And then he's off to Seattle for the Winter Institute Booksellers Conference that I mentioned earlier. <clears throat> so if we can stay on this slide for a second, let's just um, introduce sort of the book cover part of the presentation. Um, of how we arrived at the book cover for The Housekeepers. And this cover was designed by my colleague, Gwyn Banting, who couldn't be here tonight, but I'm gonna talk about it on her behalf. And certainly Melanie knows a lot about the evolution of this cover. Um, I hope this part will be interactive. So please put your comments in the chat box. We love that the chat box has been lit up all night long. Um, and I think really the first question that anybody should ever ask, you know, yourself is, do you like this book cover? Would you pick up a book called The Housekeepers with this cover? So good. Okay, that's a good start. That's promising. Um, now onto the next slide, please. With that, we'll go to the earliest form of this book cover, which in this case came from England, where the UK publisher created this cover that you see on the left side. It's an ode to Downton Abbey with the house bell um, front and center. And the UK cover had a tagline which reads, it's your house, but it's their rules. Not bad, right? It's actually a really great starting point. Um, and why start from scratch if the UK has already come up with, with this? Um, but as I'm sure you know, different countries will have different book covers because each territory knows what works best in their market, or at least we think we know what works best in our market. So we thought, let's look at different background colors just to lighten things up a little bit. And th th these different options you see on the right is what we showed the HarperCollins Salesforce and HarperCollins sells our books out into the world. And in case you didn't know this, the sales team often vetoes the covers that we come up with. Um, it's a very standard part of the process because they know what they're going to come up against when they're presenting the book to the head buyer at Target or Barnes and Noble or Costco. So their job is also to see what other books are out in the marketplace that are doing well and does this stand up to those, those books. So in this case, what HarperCollins did was they said, can you come up with something different? We like these, but we want something that tells more of a story. So ask yourself, and again, feel free to put it in the chat box, do you agree with that? Is the UK cover or, or these options not enough? Do they give off a tone that you were expecting with a book like this or that you weren't expecting? And even if you don't put it in the chat box, it's just a question to think for yourself, right? It's, it's a question that we kind of invisibly all do anyway in a bookstore, right? Um, or ask yourself, does this cover remind you of something? And is that association a good thing or a bad thing? So on to the next slide now. And you'll see, we'll spend some time on this slide. We've blown the doors wide open. Um, so what does it mean to show more of the story. In this case, it means showing a woman like the housekeeper. It means 
showing different household objects to underline the housekeeper's storyline. And so you see uh, options here. Some are very simple and iconic, like the key on a red background, which to me reminds me of uh, The Maid by Nita Prose, and not in a bad way, in a good way. Um, or you see variations of the housekeeper's apron. And some look quirky, and some look serious. And then you have a lot of variations of household objects. You have in some keys, flowers, clocks, um, candlesticks, chandeliers, you see a staircase. And then ask yourself, and then just observe, intertwined with all of these options are the ways we present the book title. So sometimes the title looks classy. Sometimes it's in a banner or in a ribbon, or sometimes the title is on a slant. And you can easily see, especially when they're side by side, how each variation, even small variation, changes the tone of the book cover. So for example, there's one on the top row that shows the back of the apron of the housekeeper. Uh, it's the third one on the, on the top row. To me, that looks almost literary and almost nonfiction-y, which is so very different than say, um, the first book on the second row with the clock and the red ribbon and the green leaves, you know, th this is all just to show you again, the variety of what we go through. So I'll pause on this for a second. So you can just sit with these because um, in actual fact, all of this process that we're doing right now mimics what a cover meeting at a publishing house is like, you know, by this point, we've briefed the art director on what we're looking for. And then the art director presents the interpretation or their interpretation of what we wanted. So as a group, we talk this through, you know, what covers should we eliminate immediately or disqualify? Or are there parts of one cover that we love, but we wanna see it on this, this concept. So, you know, we like the clock, but not the red ribbon. Can we try the clock with the slanted font, et cetera, et cetera. And Randy, I can also just give a little more context for some of these too. You know, this book is a heist, but it's historical, right? So, um, you know, some of these covers really lean into mystery. And then some of these covers really lean into his historical. And we wanted a cover that kind of did a little bit of both. And that's, you know, was the real challenge, I think, for the art team um, to, you know, to have a cover that does multiple things. And so, um, like the first one in red, the housekeepers and and the one next to it with the apron, like those really evoke mysteries like the maid, like Randy said. And we didn't feel like that encompassed the full book and the full kind of glamour of this party and just how how big and widely appealing we felt the premise was. We felt like that would narrow the audience too much. Um, and then some of the ones on the second row felt like they might have a little bit of a magical element to it or um, elements that just kind of evoked a speculative type of book, like the one with the door. You know, doors are a lot of times associated with magical elements, like you saw in J.C. Cervantes' um, cover, for example. So for us, the challenge was, okay, how do we find a cover that has the right mood that says, you know, big party and also has the intrigue of heist. Um, and so you'll see at the bottom that, you know, of all these, we ended up um, showing the last four on the bottom to a group of consumers because we said, you know what, we've tried so many covers and it would be great to get the input of people who are just going to be seeing this for the first time and haven't read the book. They've only read the copy for it. And let's see what their initial impression is. They haven't been through this whole process and don't have kind of the, the bias or the baggage that we have after, you know, looking at so many different options. And so the one that they chose is this one, um, with the yellow ribbon and, and the key and the black background. And I'll let Randy come back in to kind of talk about how we got from there to the cover that um, that we really did land with that you saw before. Sure, but like, I'm looking at the um, the chat box. First of all, Kelly, you you might think you'd, you'd love to be in some of those meetings. Some of these meetings are, are hard because even just look at the, the chat box discussion, right? There's for every concept, there's three different people who, who love, hate, or you know, don't care for, for the books. So when we talk about books, it's 
can be subjective. So it's it's super interesting, the process. Um, what I would say is, uh, yeah, so when we landed on, on the, the cover at the bottom with the giant husky and the yellow ribbon, we're gonna show you on the next slide, if, if we advance right now, please, even that can go any which way you want it to. So we settled on one concept, but the art director still needs to finesse it. So she tried different fonts, different colors. Does it feel too dark? You know, so I'm oversimplifying this final stage, but eventually we got to this final version and the version that gets posted onto Indigo, Amazon, Barnes and Noble. Um, it's the version that we printed our advanced reading copies with. But just to say that this entire process that we just walked through in 10 minutes, eight minutes, takes months and clearly dozens of different drafts. And that's just for one book. And we publish many books. Um, and you know, there's thousands of books that are published every, every month um, and every year. So I just wanna maybe in closing, go back to the original question, now that you all have more context, would you pick up this book? And do, are you feeling like, now that you've seen some of the others, you know what I mean? Like, it's just an interesting question to ask. And that's part of why we love doing this too, because you're our already baked consumer testing as well, right? How you react to this is a very good indicator of how the public will react um, in July when this book comes out. So thank you. I can see, uh, I, I can't read all of the comments right now, but this is really, um, this is really great. Um, and I, oh, sorry, and if I may, I'll just say what I've learned from being a small part of this covers process is to not keep things personal, meaning like, I don't like this cover because I don't like blue covers, but rather what's more helpful is I don't like this because it feels too gothic for what the book is, or that it feels too young or, you know, not sophisticated enough, or like Melanie was saying with, with the need to prose cover. So, and one other thing I'll mention is the importance of a tagline, because the one we added, I believe that Melanie um, helped create, adds so much value to the overall package. And that tagline is, a dazzling party, a daring heist, never underestimate the women downstairs. And that's right on the, at the top of, of this book cover. So, um, yeah, I mean, the, this is, um, that's the book cover presentation for the housekeepers. Um, I hope you enjoyed the cover, but I also just hope you enjoy the read. It's so good. Um, and really that brings our event to a close. I know that Aaron and Valerie will send out a form for you to fill in um, if you want an e-galley of one of the books you heard about tonight. But you can email me anytime at uh, randy.chan at harpercollins.com or through Aaron. Um, I'll get those emails. And I hope you tell all of your friends about these great books that will soon be out into the world. Um, I wanted to thank Laura, April, Melanie, um, Pam for their amazing presentations. Thanks to Aaron and Valerie for this partnership and thank you all and have a good night, everyone. Oh, Sorry, and Randy, I just, yeah. yeah, I put the link in there, everybody. The link to pick your book is right there. It's a Survey Monkey link. Sorry, my. <laughs> My daughter, my daughter's decided to participate. So yeah, feel free to, I'm just keep putting it there as everybody thanks everybody. But thank you everybody for, for joining. And uh, yeah, what an interesting presentation. Good night, everyone. Thank you.